Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Virology. All right, I'm going to start with a joke, okay? I didn't make this up. I just saw it on Instagram, but it's good. I should really put this on an exam, but I'm going to, I can't resist. So it's a picture of a double stranded DNA and a single stranded RNA. And the double stranded DNA says to the RNA, single. And the RNA says, always. What's wrong with that? That's pretty funny, right? If, you, if all RNAs were single-stranded, right? You know, right? Yes. What's wrong with it? Well, RNA isn't always single. Can you name a viral RNA that is not single-stranded? Mm. I put you on the spot, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Real viruses, double-stranded RNA, and there are lots of other viruses too. You could be obnoxious if you wanted to, mm -hmm. right? That's not really correct. Anyway, um, all right, one more joke. This is I told you outside as well. What do you call a bee from America? This is pretty good, right? I didn't make it up. Oh, I get it. You get a USB. All right, since, since I'm on a roll, <laughs> what happened when the flu joined Instagram? It went viral. Almost. But there's an even better answer. It became an influenza, <laughs> right? Today we're gonna to talk about a rather dry subject, but nevertheless uh, important. It's called transcription and RNA processing. And this is a process that happens to DNA viruses that have uh, double-stranded DNA in their reproduction cycles. And so in the Baltimore scheme here, that includes the class one, class one, the double-stranded DNA viruses, the, the class two, the single-stranded DNA, the um, hepatitis viruses, uh, and also the retroviruses, because they go through a DNA intermediate. So they have double-stranded DNA in their reproduction cycles. The key thing for you to understand here is that in cells infected with viruses with DNA as their genome, at least one protein, one viral protein, sometimes more than one, but at least one has to be made before DNA replication can occur. And we'll see what that protein is when we talk about DNA replication. But it's really important to understand that, in other words, to get a protein, you need to make mRNA. And that's done from a double-stranded DNA template. And that uh, requires always double-stranded DNA. So the first key that comes out of that is that not all viral DNAs are ready for transcription. So the important rule is that you cannot do transcription, which is the synthesis of mRNA <coughs> from DNA, unless the DNA is double-stranded, all right? It cannot ever happen. And so if some viral genomes are not double-stranded in the particle. By the way, genome, when I say viral genome, what I mean is the the nucleic acid that's in the particle, right? It's not what may be in the cell. And a good example is retroviruses. The genome is RNA, but in the cell you find double-stranded retroviral DNA, but that's not the genome. So here's an example of a virus where the DNA is ready for transcription. This, these are polyomaviruses. These are small double-stranded DNA-containing viruses. We will talk about these quite a bit in the next few lectures. Circular double-stranded DNA, very small, about uh, 5,000 bases of double-stranded DNA. That's what they look like right there on the right, double-stranded circles of DNA. Completely double-stranded. So it comes, the virus uh, comes in the cell and eventually the DNA gets in the nucleus. It is ready for transcription because it's double-stranded DNA. But not all viruses are like that. By the way, you notice here that this viral DNA, the circle uh, in the nucleus, it's shown covered with nucleosomes. So our DNA is covered with nucleosomes. That's what chromatin is, right? This, this, and, and most double-stranded DNAs, when they enter the nucleus, the nucleus immediately covers them with nucleosomes. It's called chromatinization. But this one is interesting because in the particle, the DNA is, is packed into nucleosomes, which is unusual for viruses. Usually they are not in the particle, but when the DNA gets in the nucleus, 
they're coated with nucleosomes. That's actually a way of silencing the DNA because the cell doesn't know, you know, all of a sudden there's this foreign DNA coming into the nucleus, the cell just silences it. So viruses need to have ways to counter that, which we, we will talk about later. So uh, polyomaviruses and the key virus we'll talk about, it's called SV40, simian virus 40, which has been a model system to work on. It's ready for transcription, but not all viral DNAs are. Some of them have to be converted to templates for transcription. So for example, the hepadenovirus genomes, they're, par they're circular, but partially double-stranded, and there's a partial single strand, plus there's a protein attached to one end and an RNA attached. This cannot be transcribed. There's no way it's gonna be transcribed. Even the double-stranded part's not gonna be transcribed. So the first thing that happens when this enters the nucleus is that it's repaired. The cell sees a single-stranded DNA and it repairs it because the cell does not want single-stranded DNA. So it's repaired and now you have a template that's ready for transcription. So the cell has unwittingly uh, fixed the genome. Another kind of virus which we'll talk about in some detail, parvoviruses. They have a single-stranded DNA genome. Again, the cell takes this up in the nucleus and it's repaired undergoes DNA repair and makes it double-stranded. It's not DNA replication. So DNA replication means making lots of copies of a DNA genome, all right? Remember that you go in with one and you make hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of copies. That's DNA replication. Just fixing one molecule that might get in the nucleus is not replication, it's just uh, genome repair. And then finally we have the retroviruses where the genome is RNA. So for parvo and hepadna and adeno and SV40, the genome is DNA clearly. It's what's in the particle. But for retroviruses, the genome is RNA. But when it gets in the cell, it's copied to a circular double-stranded DNA by an enzyme that's in the particle, reverse transcriptase. And that uh, DNA integrates into the host cell DNA and it's transcribed there. So as double-stranded DNA, it is ready for transcription. So some DNA genomes need to be repaired, which do not. Well, SV40, I told you, any genome that's double-stranded DNA, adenovirus among the viruses that we're gonna talk about in, in this course, double-stranded DNA genome, herpes viruses, double-stranded DNA genome. They don't need to be repaired, they go in the nucleus and transcription will begin almost immediately. And transcription is what we're gonna talk about today. Transcription is making mRNA from double-stranded DNA. So in my, my world, transcription means only that, nothing else. Many virologists you may hear calling what we talked about last time, the synthesis of mRNA from an RNA genome, they may call that transcription, but I don't agree with that. I think transcription was initially described as double-stranded DNA to mRNA, and that's the way we're gonna use it here, just to be clear. So making our mRNA from an RNA, what is that called? Our mRNA synthesis, let's call it that, keep it simple. So this is a historical word, transcription. You know what transcription is in terms of writing. You, you copy something from something else. So here we're making mRNA from from a DNA template. And again, the DNA viruses uh, undergo transcription, so that's what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, in the cell, there are three enzymes that make RNA from DNA. And all of them don't need a primer. So they do de novo RNA synthesis. So last time, some of those RNA-dependent RNA polymerases that we talked about they need a primer, but none of these enzymes, there are DNA-dependent RNA polymerases, none of them require a primer. So there are three of them. And, and the reason we're talking about this is because for many viruses, they don't encode their own DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. They, ha they have to utilize that of the cell. And so that's why we're talking about this. And they're called Paul one Paul two and Paul three. And the, in the cell, uh, these enzymes have different functions. So for example, Paul one makes a precursor to ribosomal RNA. So as you know, the ribosomes are made up of a lot of RNA and protein, and that RNA is 
is made from DNA by Paul 1. As far as we know, there's no viral RNA made by Paul 1. Paul 2 is what you may recognize as the enzyme that makes mRNA from DNA templates. And you can see, so, so uh, pre-mRNA, because it has to be processed before it becomes mRNA. But it also makes precursors to microRNAs and small nuclear RNAs and long non-coding RNAs. These are all regulatory RNAs that you find in the cell. Viral RNAs are also made by RNA Paul 2 We'll see mRNAs, pre-mRNAs are made, and also microRNAs uh, and some uh, other. So the genome of one virus, hepatitis delta virus, the R <laughs> this is really amazing. The RNA genome is actually copied by uh, RNA polymerase 2. And finally, Paul 3 in the cell makes precursors to tRNAs and also uh, other cellular RNAs, but it, it also can make some viral RNAs, in particular, uh, the adenovirus 2 VA RNA is, has a very interesting function uh, in immune antagonism that we'll talk about later. Now, if you reproduce uh, in the cytoplasm of a cell, and pox viruses and giant viruses do that, you don't have access to these polymerases because they are principally in the nucleus. They are made in the cytoplasm for sure, like all proteins are, but they immediately are imported in the nucleus. So there's effectively no, none of those proteins in the cytoplasm. So if a virus is going to reproduce in the cytoplasm, it has to encode its own DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Of course, other viruses that even are in the nucleus may encode their, their own as well, but it's a requirement for those that are in the cytoplasm. So here's an overview of the process we're gonna look at today. We have double-stranded DNA at the top, and the red arrow is what is I'm gonna use as a convention to show where transcription initiates. And you have, and this is in the nucleus now, so here is the nuclear membrane there with some nuclear pores. So the, the double-stranded DNA is transcribed by, in this case, the Paul II, which is making a precursor to mRNA. So there's the pre-mRNA. It's capped at the five prime end. We'll take a look at the cap in a moment. And it's not mRNA because it needs to be modified in a few ways. First of all, it has uh, introns. It has intervening sequences that have to be removed from the pre-mRNA. And then it has to be, have poly A added to the three prime end. So poly A addition and splicing ends up giving you an mRNA where the introns are removed. It's capped, it's polyadenylated, and then only that mRNA can be exported into the cytoplasm where then of course it's gonna be translated into protein. And in fact, as we'll see later, the process of splicing, removing the introns, actually marks these mRNAs for export. So in the cell, if you're not spliced, you stay in the nucleus until you're spliced. But it turns out there are some viral RNAs that are never spliced, even though they have introns. That was one of those is shown here. So the green is the, uh, the exonic sequence, which codes for protein, and the red is the intron, which should be spliced out. In some cases, these are not spliced, and yet the viral genomes can get out, and I'll show you how that happens later. It's very clever. Now, transcription is highly regulated. It's, it's one of the most highly regulated processes in us because you don't need every mRNA made in every cell in our body, right? You don't need neuron-specific proteins in our muscle, for example. And so that is all regulated at the level of transcription, including during development, where you turn on and you turn off genes in different ways. A lot of transcriptional regulation. And that is because the, the region of the DNA that specifies transcription has a lot of sequences that, uh, that bind proteins and that can be regulated. And so here's a typical part of a DNA that contains all these regulatory sequences. And so we start, here's double-stranded DNA. We have at the right here a red arrow. So that means that's where transcription begins. At that, that's the plus one uh, of the DNA, and that's where the RNA begins. And then you have all these sequences around it that can regulate that activity. For example, there's an initiator sequence right around the start site that has to be a certain sequence to get accurate initiation. Uh, upstream from that is called the TADA sequence, which binds a protein called the TADA binding protein, or TF2D, 
And that protein could be regulated, so you could regulate trans transcription. And then there are upstream local regulatory sequences that bind other proteins that may be cell type specific. So a gene will never work in a cell if that protein is not present, or it can be turned on if the protein is turned on, its synthesis is turned on, or it can be shut off similarly. All right, so the, the initiator, the TADA, and all these other regulatory sequences, that constitutes what we call the promoter because it promotes uh, mRNA synthesis. But then there can be even more distant regulatory elements. There can be elements that are up to 10,000 bases away. We call these distant regulatory sequences. They can either enhance transcription or they can silent it, silence it. They can be moved around and they will still work. So this whole area, these proximal sequences and the distal sequences, that's called the transcriptional control region. And the control is mediated by proteins that bind this DNA. So the protein can repress or stimulate transcription, and that's how regulation is achieved. So here's some examples of regulatory sequences in viral DNAs, and they're all very different. And that's because they have to work in different cell types and, and be regulated in different ways. So on the top is the adenovirus major late promoter. Okay, all that means is that it's turned on late in virus infection. We'll see what that means in a moment. Uh, and it's, it's a major one. It makes a lot of pre-mRNAs. And you can see it has a start site plus one. It has a, um, an initiator sequence in yellow. And then there's a Tata box in green and then some upstream control regions, USF1, CPF1, and, and that's because those sequences bind those proteins of that name. SV40 early promoter is on the bottom. You can see it's different. It does have a Tata box, doesn't have an initiator, has multiple initiation start sites, but upstream is this SPL sequence that's repeated multiple times, and that binds a specific protein. And even within the same virus, adenovirus type two, the early promoter, E2 early promoter, is very different from the major late promoter, as you can see. So different um, uh, mixtures of proteins that bind, uh, sorry, proteins that bind these DNA sequences that can regulate transcription. Again, you can see from the scale here, this is about 100 base pairs of DNA where all this is contained. Now, uh, here's an overview of transcription. You don't really need to memorize any of this, but I just want to give you an, an idea of how it happens, because we're going to throw a lot of proteins out there, and you may wonder how they're working. So here are the steps that happen. We know the structures of many of these proteins. That's why they're drawn uh, in these ways. So here we have double-stranded DNA at the top. The promoter region is in yellow, and there's the initiation site at plus one. First thing that happens, we have RNA polymerase, so Paul 2 the enzyme itself, is going to bind the promoter region, along with all of these other protein factors, initiation proteins, including uh, the Tata binding protein TF2D, which is going to bind the Tata sequence. So they all make a, what's called an initiation complex here, and they're all needed for transcription. And by the way, this, this transcriptional activity can be modulated by other proteins binding at sites within this, but they're not shown here. So that's initially called the closed initiation complex because it can't do anything, it just sits there. And then it, it transitions to an open complex when energy is, is used, ATP in this case is hydrolyzed. It's now an open complex, which means it can start moving down the DNA and copying it and making an mRNA. And it, Paul II makes a lot of false starts. So you can see here a board of transcripts. It makes a lot of short transcripts before it gets going. And then finally it begins to make a transcription complex. It starts to move down away from the promoter and make this nascent uh, RNA at the bottom. So multiple steps, but this is an, an example of how everything assembles at the promoter. Uh, on the right is a model of the uh, RNA polymerase II uh, showing you the active site. And again, just like for RNA synthesis, magnesium is cru crucial for the catalysis to hold the triphosphates in place. You can see one magnesium there. Uh, and so we have the double-stranded 
uh, DNA, right, coming in. It's denatured as it passes through the enzyme. Uh, and then the, um, the product is being made here. So the mRNA is red and you can see base pairing happening here. And that's the exit channel for the mRNA. So a new base would be added to the right there of that red end. And the NTPs come in through a channel in the enzyme and then out comes the double-stranded DNA. So it's transiently melted so that you can copy one strand and then it reforms as double-stranded DNA. So that's how it works. Uh, just to show you how these long range sequences can enhance or silence transcription. So here is the initiation complex that I just showed you with Paul 2 and all these other uh, proteins forming that con complex, uh, the initiation complex. Uh, there, there are enhancers that can be up to 10,000 bases away and they can enhance transcription. And what they do is they bind proteins which then bind the initiation complex and stabilize it in a way to increase transcription. So they're called enhancers. They're also silencers that work at a distance and reduce transcription because as I said, it's regulated. And you can move these around. They don't have to be 10,000 base pairs away. You can, as long as the DNA can form a loop, as you see here, they will function. So what about these proteins that regulate transcription. So uh, there are DNA binding proteins. I've already mentioned that to you that bind these specific sequences. There are many, many of them. Some of them are in all of our cells and some of them are cell specific. So many of them are regulated and that, that's what regulates transcription. So we call these sequence specific DNA binding proteins because the protein binds a specific sequence in the DNA. Then we have another group called coactivating molecules. These are typically viral proteins that can activate transcription, but they don't bind the DNA. Many of them work by modifying chromatin. Now chromatin, as you know, consists of DNA wrapped around nucleosomes as is shown here. And how tightly the DNA is wrapped around the nucleosome controls whether the polymerase can get into it to transcribe it. So if the DNA is tightly wrapped and the nucleosomes are close together, it's not easily transcribed. On the other hand, if it's loosely wrapped, there's more space for the polymerase to come in and transcription will occur. And this tightness of the chromatin can be regulated by chemical modification of the proteins in the histones by methylation or acetylation, by adding them or taking them off. And we'll see an example of that today. So those are how some of these coactivators work without binding DNA directly. They can stimulate or modulate transcription by influencing its modification uh, by these chemical groups. Now, as far as the DNA binding proteins, they have a modular organization like is shown on this slide. So they have a DNA binding domain. So this is a schematic of a protein. They have a DNA binding domain. As it sounds, it, this is the part of the protein that binds the DNA. And this has different motifs depending on the particular protein. It can have a zinc finger where a zinc is coordinating different amino acids in the protein. It could be a helix turn helix. It could be a basic region of the protein. They all have DNA binding activities. Then we have a, a par part of the protein that's involved in dimer formation. This is typically a leucine zipper, a series of leucines which will interact uh, or not. That's why it's called a zipper and mediate the two, the two monomers uh, interacting. And these proteins often act as dimers in binding DNA. We have a nuclear localization signal, NLS, because these proteins are made in the cytoplasm. They have to get in the nucleus to do their thing. And then finally, an activation domain, which is the part that stimulates transcription, most likely by interacting with that big transcriptional complex that I just showed you. That's a lot of information. So let's uh, take a break and ask you about it. All right. It's a little bit of a tricky question here, okay? but it's, just, it's something I really want you to understand. What's the first biosynthetic event that occurs in cells infected with double-stranded DNA viruses? Is it membrane fusion, transcription, DNA replication, protein synthesis, all of the above? These are, all, these are the only choices you have here, so you have to pick one of them. What's the first biosynthetic event? Okay, let's see what we have here. 
So transcription is the first biosynthetic event. Biosynthetic means we're making something. Transcription is it. Membrane fusion is, we're not making anything. We're just fusing two membranes. There's no synthesis. DNA replication can't happen until you make at least one protein, right? You have to make at least one protein. And to do that, you need to make mRNA, which is transcription. And you can't make proteins until you do transcription. So that's why that's the answer, okay? Hopefully you, you understand that. So here's some, we're gonna go over a couple of models, strategies for transcription. And I wanna summarize some of the situations here in terms of where things come from. Origin of transcriptional components, right? So some uh, viruses, everything is host. All the enzymes and <coughs> proteins, regulatory proteins, they're all host derived. And these are the viruses on the right that do that. Retroviruses, some retroviruses, not all of them, uh, plant viruses, and these circoviruses that infect uh, all of us, little single-stranded DNA viruses. So they're so small, they can't encode anything, so they all depend on the host. Then there are some viruses where mostly it's the host, but there's one viral protein that is made that does some regulatory things, and there's an example in, in bacteriophages where actually a viral protein becomes a polymerase, is a polymerase that transcribes the late genes, not the early genes, but the late genes. But that's just in phages. Not that, I mean, they are viruses, so it's okay. And then there's a viral protein that regulates transcription. There are many viruses that do that, and we will talk about that today. And then finally, there are viruses where there are multiple viral proteins that regulate transcription, like adeno and herpes viruses. We'll see an example of that today. And finally, there are some viruses where all the transcriptional apparatus is viral. And those are like the Mimi viruses, the giant viruses, and the pox viruses that reproduce in the cytoplasm, right? Because remember, you can't transcribe if, you, if you're not going in the nucleus. So the, for some reason, they've evolved to set up shop in the cytosol, and therefore they have to encode all of their uh, transcriptional proteins. Now, one of the keys here I want you to think about is a viral DNA comes into a cell and it has a promoter. That promoter has to be recognized by the cellular machinery. So if th those viruses at the top that relied completely on host machinery, those promoters have to be recognized by the host cell. But there are some viruses where the promoters are not recognized, at least the early promoters, as we'll see. So the virus has to bring in a transcriptional protein that will activate those promoters, okay? So you don't assume that the viral promoter is gonna work in a, any particular cell. All right, so I wanna talk a bit about regulation of transcription to give you an idea of what I'm talking about because I said at the beginning, transcription is regulated. It's also regulated in viral infections during the infectious cycle for reasons that you'll see in a moment. So here are two general schemes of regulation. There's cascade and either positive or negative autoregulatory loops. And we're gonna see specific examples of that, but this is just a general slide to show you what's going on. At the top, we have cascade regulation, which simply means we have a viral DNA that gets into a cell. We have a promoter up here in yellow. It's transcribed to make an mRNA, which is translated into a protein, which we call protein X. That protein is then going to activate another promoter in the same viral DNA. So that's why we call it cascade regulation, because this protein will regulate this promoter. It turns on that promoter, which makes mRNAs and it makes proteins. Could even Those proteins could even go on to regulate other promoters as well, one after the other. So we see this in many viral DNAs, this kind of cascade regulation, where the viral genome first goes in, makes one protein, and then that is needed for activating another promoter. And you can imagine that that's good for timing. If you want to time genes so they're on later, that's what you would do. And we'll see a nice example of that. The bottom is a positive autoregulatory loop where this promoter makes an mRNA, controls the synthesis of an mRNA, and the encoded protein further activates the same promoter. So we have protein X going back to the promoter and binding, it's a DNA binding protein, for example, and turning on more synthesis. 
So initially the genome gets in, there's very little activity at this promoter, and then once the protein is made, it's turned up. So, we're, and that can also be negative. So it could also be that late in a reproduction cycle, you don't need as much of that protein because it's not structural. And late in the cycle, you typically need structural proteins. So you could then turn it down as well. So it can be positive or, or it can be negative. All right, so let's go through three viruses and look at their transcriptional proteins to, to illustrate this. And we're gonna do SV40, adenovirus, and herpes virus. We're gonna get bigger and bigger genomes. Now, SV40 is a monkey virus. It's a non-human primate virus. Originally isolated, well, actually, um, they used to make the polio vaccine in non-human primate cells, kidney cells, which they, and they captured these animals in the wild brought them in the lab, sacrificed them, take out the kidneys and make cells, and they would grow the polio vaccine in that. It turned out there, there was another virus in those cells, a monkey virus called SV40, which was given to many millions of Americans, which fortunately doesn't seem to have caused any problems, um, but it could have, right? But this was in the 50s before we knew anything. We were just happy to make a polio vaccine. Anyway, that's what SV40 is. It turned out to be a model system. It's a small DNA virus, a circular double-stranded DNA, which we've encountered before. So there is the genome, and it has two phases of transcription, an early and a late phase. Uh, and they both are initiated from the same uh, promoter region right here, and it also turns out to be the origin of DNA replication. We'll talk about that next time. The ORI is where DNA synthesis begins, but it's also containing the, the promoters. So there's gonna be a promoter in both directions because the early transcripts are made in one direction around the circle and the late are made around the other. Okay, so that's the transcriptional program. At the top is the timing of the program. So uh, SV40 infects a cell and goes into the nucleus before it can make DNA it needs to make at least one viral protein, right? And so that protein is called the large T protein. And this is produced by the early promoter of the virus. There's no late promoter activity at this point in infection. The late promoter is silent. You only have early promoter production, which makes this LT protein. And large T then turns on late transcriptional unit, the late program here, and you have the late mRNAs made, and those encode the structural proteins. And so when large T is made, lots of it is made early on, it stimulates DNA synthesis. So that's the one protein you need for DNA synthesis. We'll see how that works next time. And then it turns on the transcription of the late promoter. So the, again, the late promoter is off, and if you make enough DNA, it gets turned on, and we call that anti-repression. So this is a relatively simple program, early and late phases. And again, the, the reason you have early and late is because when the virus first gets in the cell, there's no point in making capsid proteins because there's no DNA to put in them. You have to make a lot of DNA, and then once you get to a certain level of DNA, that stimulates DNA, that stimulates late transcription, which encodes the capsid proteins, and then they can be encapsidated. If you make a lot of proteins early on, they will assemble into capsids, but they'll be empty, so they're useless. Now, how does the late promoter get turned on? Here's uh, an experiment that shows the mechanism. Uh, on the left is a graph that shows the relative concentration on the y-axis of viral genomes, the late RNA, and a key protein called initiator binding protein. That's a cell protein. Initiator binding protein, a cell protein. And this is time after infection. So initiator binding protein is in orange. It's always at the same concentration. It doesn't change, it's a cell protein, okay? It's a cell protein. Then we have viral genomes. So we come in with some uh, viral genomes, and there's just a few that enter the cell, and then the DNA replication begins. You get more and more DNA, and as DNA replication begins, you have late RNA being produced. So it's the DNA replication that turns on the late promoter. 
And on the right is how it does that. So in the early phase uh, of infection, the, um, the, the late promoter is off because these initiator binding proteins bind to the DNA and repress initiation at the promoter. So this is the late promoter early in infection, in the early phase. So the, the promoters uh, region, this is the promoter region with these different DNA binding regions. They're all blocked by the IBP, which represses transcription. Then as you make DNA, make more and more DNA. So here's the late phase. We're now in DNA synthesis. You make more DNAs than you have IBP to bind them. And so at some point you have actually more DNAs than you have IBPs. So now you have DNAs without any IBP bound and that turns on the late promoter. So you're basically titrating out the initiator binding protein as you make more and more DNA. So it's an interesting way of making sure you have a lot of DNAs before turning on the synthesis of the capsid proteins. Remember the late mRNAs encode capsid proteins. So that is how that, pro that promoter is regulated. And we'll see that that is a similar story for the other viruses that we're gonna talk about as well. So here's an overview of this transcription cycle. The virus binds its receptor. Eventually the DNA gets in the nucleus. It's taken up by endocytosis. The DNA is in the nucleus. You have early promoter activity, which makes the T, T mRNA, large T mRNA that goes out in the cytoplasm. You make large T, it goes back in the nucleus. Uh, and large T stimulates DNA synthesis. And so here now you're seeing DNA being replicated. And once you titrate out the IBP, you start to have late uh, promoter activity. Those mRNAs are made, they encode structural proteins that go in the nucleus, assemble capsids around the new DNA. So that's the program. And the function of early and late phases, again, is to delay the synthesis of structural proteins until DNA is, is replicated. Because as I said, if you make capsid proteins without DNA, they will make empty capsids and you can't get DNA in them once they're formed. So the, the early promoter is active during the early phase. There's nothing blocking it. The IBP doesn't bind to it. And so that is an example of a promoter that's recognized by the cell machinery immediately. But the late promoter is blocked by those initiator binding proteins. So adenovirus, by the way, so SV40, 5,000 base pair circular DNA. Adenovirus now is bigger. It's about 35,000 base pairs of double-stranded DNA. A little more complicated transcriptional regulation. Here we have not just early and late, but we have immediate early, early and late promoters, three different promoters. So we have now three proteins that is gonna govern the regulation. And again, DNA synthesis, just like in SV40. So as when adenovirus <coughs> DNA gets in the nucleus, it has a promoter, the immediate early or IE promoter that is active. It can be recognized by the cell machinery. The, that encodes an mRNA which uh, produces this protein called E1A. E1A is necessary for the activation of the early promoter. So this is a nice example of cascade regulation, right? You need E1A to get activity of the early promoter, and that results in the production of E2 protein. And the E2 protein is needed for DNA synthesis, much like T antigen. And once DNA synthesis begins, you activate the late promoter and that makes structural proteins. And there, there's also another protein here, 4A2, that's involved in enhancing late gene just transcription as well as DNA synthesis. So it's really similar to SV40 with the addition of this earlier protein, uh, E1A. And this is, an, this is an important protein, which we're gonna come back to later when we talk about how viruses cause cancer. It's gonna play a key role in that. Now, e E1A is needed for the activity of the early promoter. The early promoter requires cell proteins for transcription called E2F. They were originally discovered in adenovirus-infected cells. They're cell proteins, and they're called E2 because they're needed for activity of the E2, or the early promoter and F stands for family. 
And this is how that, that works. So <clears throat> here's E1A, which is the product of the early, immediate early transcription uh, of adenovirus. Um, and the virus genome, the, to get the early proteins made, to get the early transcriptional unit activated, it requires a cell protein called E2F, all right? Now in the cell, E2F is, is bound up by a couple of cellular proteins, DP1 here and RB, retinoblastoma. This is a protein that was discovered in eye tumors in, in young children. We'll talk about that later. It's really an amazing story. But E2F isn't available to adenovirus because it's bound up to RB. And so in adenovirus, the way this works is that when E2F is bound to RB, E2F will still bind the early promoter in the adenovirus genome, but the promoter doesn't work. And the reason is that the RB portion recruits histone deacetylases to the promoter region, to the DNA. So what's a histone deacetylase? I told you already that closed chromatin cannot be transcribed. But if you modify the chromatin, say with acetyl groups as shown here, just a protein modification, you open up the chromatin and it can be transcribed. Histone deacetylases remove the acetyl groups and they, go, they make the DNA go from relaxed to closed chromatin. So recruiting a histone deacetylase to this DNA by RB shuts off the promoter. And it's not available, so the adenovirus genome can't be transcribed from the early region. So what does E1A do? It binds RB. And now you have E2F protein bound to the promoter. There's no RB, because it's bound, taken away by E1A. And now there's no histone deacetylase, so the chromatin is an open uh, conformation, and it can be transcribed. That's why. Adenovirus, early region transcription requires this E1A protein, an immediate early protein. All right, so this is a little bit of a complicated story here. I want you to remember it because when we talk about how viruses cause cancer, this is gonna be a, a key part of that. Now, this is a map of the adenogenome. It's big double-stranded DNA, as I said, 35,000 base pairs. There are promoters on both strands so here on the top strand at the left end, here are the early region, the immediate early region promoters. There are a couple of mRNAs made there, including the E1A that we've just talked about. Uh, then there is a major late promoter on the top here that encodes lots of structural proteins. But on the other strand, there's the E2, the early two region promoter, the early as opposed to the immediate early, which drives the synthesis of all the components you need for making DNA. DNA binding protein, the terminal protein, as we'll see later, and the polymerase itself. So the immediate early promoter on the top, then the early promoter on the bottom, and then the late promoter on the top again to make the capsid proteins. And how that's regulated, we've just talked about. So here's a schematic of the whole system. Adenovirus, we've talked about how the DNA gets into the nucleus after cell entry. Immediate early mRNA is first made. The other pr promoters are inactive. E2 is inactive because it's bound to RB. The, um, the late promoter is inactive because it's, it's bound to repressive factors. So you make immediate early mRNA, it goes out in the cytosol, E1A protein is made, it comes in, frees up RB, takes away RB from the E2 promoter. So now you can get early region synthesis of mRNAs. Those include the DNA synthesis proteins, which go in and now replicate the genome. And once the genome replicates, you now have anti-repression of the late promoter, synthesis of capsid protein mRNAs, and then assembly of new virus particles. So again, you have um, a, a, a division of what's made when simply to make capsid proteins after you've had a DNA synthesis. All right, finally, herpes virus, which is even bigger, like 135,000 base pairs of double-stranded DNA, and a little more complicated, but this illustrates a difference. This has the immediate early, early and late programs, and the immediate early promoter here, 
does not work in a cell. It needs a viral protein to get it to work. And so in every herpes virus particle, there is a protein in the particle. So here's the capsid inside, the nucleocapsid with DNA. And then there's the outer membrane. And in, in between, there are all these proteins. One of them is called VP16. And that protein binds the promoter and lets it be recognized by the cell transcriptional machinery. So now you have immediate early transcription, and that transcription makes a protein called ICP0, which will then activate early transcription, turns on DNA synthesis, the early region encodes DNA synthesis genes, and that eventually will activate the late promoter as well. So a twist here, similar to adenovirus, but the twist is that that first promoter doesn't work in the cell, it needs this VP16 protein. And this is interesting because the P16 is actually a late protein. It's made from an mRNA produced late in infection. And when we talk about herpes viruses, which cause latent infections, where everybody has herpes virus DNA in them, and periodically it's activated by various stresses, how you get VP16 <coughs> made is really interesting, and we're gonna talk about that later. So here's the overview. Herpes viruses binding the cell surface. They, the membrane actually fuses at the cell surface and the nucleocapsid is transported to the nucleus and the, the portal por uh, docks onto the nuclear pore so the DNA can get out. Uh, at the same time, the VP16 protein comes out of the particle and goes through the nuclear pore and that activates the immediate early promoter so you can get that uh, immediate early protein made. That protein goes in, the, the nucleus stimulates the production of early genes, which include those needed for DNA replication. You now replicate the genome, and then you get the late mRNAs made, which encode the structural proteins. Okay, so again, delaying so that you have enough DNA to, to package. Our next question is adeno-E1A, stimulating the expression of adeno-E2, which then stimulates the expression of adenovirus 4A2 in late proteins is an example of a negative autoregulatory loop, a repression of gene expression, cascade regulation, dimerization. All right, let's have a look at what we did here. All right, lecture seven. <laughs> First 100%, that's right, it's cascade regulation, all right. Now at the five prime end, these mRNAs have to be further modified. So we talked about how the polymerase is making, is being regulated, but it makes pre-mRNAs and it has to be modified in several ways. The first is at the five prime end, there is a cap structure, which we've talked about a lot, haven't really described. So where we have on the top left here, our double strand DNA, the transcription initiation, the transcript has a cap structure. So what is that? because all the mRNAs are gonna end up having caps. That's the little blue boxes with the C in it. This is a cap structure here on the right. So these, this is the RNA, that's base number one and base number two. They are linked, here are the sugars, the bases are just shown as, as colors there. And um, they're linked with a single phosphate, phosphodiester bond. And then this base, this cap consists of a base uh, which is typically G and um, linked with three phosphates in a five to five prime linkage. So it's not a five to three prime. So here, the three prime hydroxyl joined to the five prime carbon here, that's a five to three prime. But here, the five prime carbon here is joined to the five prime carbon of the next ribose. So it's a totally different chemical linkage. And that is what a cap is. It's this whole structure here. The um, Cap base itself, the guanine is typically methylated, and also the first two bases are also methylated, which contributes to the function of the cap, which is to stabilize the mRNA, make it better translated, help with its export, and so forth. All right, so that's a cap structure. This, this cap is actually required for splicing, for export, and for translation. The, the cap is added co-transcriptionally, Here's our RNA polymerase sitting down on a double-stranded DNA. Remember, it, it uh, makes a few abortive transcripts, but then it 
gets going. And those abortive transcripts are not capped. Only when the polymerase II gets started uh, does the capping occur. There's actually an enzyme that interacts with the RNA polymerase. It is uh, called the capping enzyme. And that only associates when the polymerase is phosphorylated, which happens after it's gone so many bases, 20 or 30 bases. The capping enzyme then caps the mRNA. So the, the mRNA has already been made a bit, 20 or 30 bases, when it is uh, chemically modified to put on this cap. So it's post-transcriptional modification. At the other end, we have to add a poly-A tail. And this also happens post-transcriptionally. You actually make a longer RNA. So there at the top is a pre-mRNA, which is longer than the final mRNA. And within it is a poly-A addition site. And so it's A-A-U-A-A-A. That is recognized by a variety of proteins in the cell, which cleave at that poly-A addition site and eventually add poly-A's to, to that site, to the three prime end. About 200 A's are added. So you can see this is a very involved series of events. You don't have to know this at all, except that it happens by internal cleavage in the pre-mRNA. So all this RNA down here is thrown away, and then the A's are added enzymatically afterwards. And those A's then end up, the cap in the poly-A, which we just talked about, end up in the exported uh, mRNAs. So the addition of poly-A to mRNAs now, we've, we've talked about RNA and DNA viruses, how that happens, and that's summarized here. So for the DNA viruses uh, that we've talked about today, the, the poly-A is added post-transcriptionally, which means you make the mRNA, and then you cleave it, and you add the poly-A to that new 3 prime end. But last time we talked about how it's added with RNA viruses, and it's typically by reiterative copying of views in a template, right? Influenza and VSV, remember the polymerase reached this point where there are a series of views that begins to stutter and make a poly A. <clears throat> and for poliovirus, that doesn't happen, but what does happen is that the viral RNA, the plus strand RNA that comes into cell has 200 U's, that's 200 A's at its three prime end. And then that's copied by the polymerase, which copies the A's into U's which are then copied back into A. So two distinct mechanisms, either reiterative copying or copying of a long U stretch in the template. The other activity or modification of the pre-mRNA is splicing to remove introns, to remove extra sequences that are not in the final product. This was first discovered in cells infected with adenoviruses where People were finding for years that the viral RNAs made in the nucleus were always longer than the mRNAs in the cytoplasm. And so an experiment was done <clears throat> where they took uh, viral DNA, sing they made it single-stranded by denaturing the double-stranded DNA, and they, pur they purified uh, one of the mRNAs that, that they were studying and hybridized the two, and they found that there wasn't a perfect match between the RNA and the DNA. There were these loops of the DNA coming out, which meant, of course, that sequences were removed from uh, the mRNA in order to find, to, to form the final mRNA. And this is the, this is a drawing of the result. This was the original result that they found. They looked in the electron microscope at these RNA-DNA hybrids, and they saw these loops, uh, which didn't make any sense. So now we know that most genes undergo this kind of splicing, as it was called, and th two individuals got the Nobel Prize in uh, 1993 for discovering that process. And the way it works is, uh, is shown here. It's actually a, um, an event that's highly conserved in evolutionary terms. In fact, we think this happened in the RNA world in the absence of proteins. So here's a picture at the top of an intron, and a sequence that's gonna be spliced out of an RNA, and then there's some exon sequences at either end. And if you look at the sequences of this region from many different mRNAs, you find many conserved bases here. For example, this A is 100% conserved. There are also conserved bases at either end. And this led to, to the idea, which was then tested experimentally, that the splicing occurs um, by a transesterification reaction. So here, is the, here are the two exons and the intron. This A, which is highly conserved, its hydroxyl attacks the first phosphate. 
and cleaves that from the exon. So now you have this intron attached to the three prime end. And then the hydroxyl, the newly formed hydroxyl in that enzyme attacks uh, the second phosphate here, releases this intron as what's called a lariat. You know, it's, it's a circuit, if you ever, you know those, a lariat, you know what a lariat is. It's a long rope with a loop at the end that cowboys used to use to throw at cows or whatever, steers, that's a lariat. And it's excised, and now you have the two exons spliced together. You, as you might imagine, you have to hold these RNAs in place as these things are happening, and that's done by proteins. So here's our pre-mRNA, and there's a series of small nuclear proteins that associate with that structure and eventually facilitate those cleavages that I just described to you, forming the mRNA and the lariat there. And so this whole complex that I show here is called a spliceosome. And you can take out the protein and it will still splice because the RNA has the ability to splice itself. We call that ribozyme activity and that's quite ancient. It predates cellular life. Now splicing can give you a lot of new proteins in your genome. So it's a very effective way to get you different kinds of proteins. And so here's a, here's a DNA or an mRNA precursor with two introns. You can remove both. Now you have exons one, two, three, and you get a protein. That's called constitutive splicing because everything's removed. But you can imagine removing one intron or only or, or, or different ones. And here, for example, we have skipped over uh, two entirely to join exons one and three. So you can get a different protein made from that. You can have alternative splice sites uh, both five prime and three prime ends where, you know, this, this, this splice site in, in one case, uh, instead of going to all the way to three, it can, it can go to, to another site there and you get different products as a result, which have some intron sequence in them, of course, as well. And they specify different proteins. So splicing gives you a way to make more proteins from a small genome. And this really illustrated here for adenovirus where you have Remember, the late promoter, made only after DNA synthesis occurs, makes a very big transcript, which goes for most of the genome. It's huge, that's why it's called the major late promoter. And it has five poly-A addition sites, here L1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So the, the mRNA can be cleaved at any of those sites and polyadenylated, and that's what's shown in the next panel there. Each of those have been polyadenylated at one of those five sites. And then these uh, pre-mRNAs can be alternatively spliced because there are lots of introns in here. They can be spliced in different ways to give you all kinds of mRNAs that encode uh, the viral protein. So um, you can get a lot of value out of a genome by splicing and alternative splicing. And on top of it, viral proteins can regulate this to stimulate it in ways that are obviously useful. Last question for today. Which statement about polyadenylation of DNA virus mRNAs is correct? It always occurs in the cytoplasm. It occurs after cleavage of pre-mRNA. Poly-A is added at the five prime end of pre-mRNA. It is specified by a stretch of U residues in the template. So DNA virus mRNAs, not RNA virus mRNAs. I don't know if anyone has ever gotten two in a row, but you have time. You got a lot of lectures left. You can do it. So the answer is for DNA virus, polyadenylation occurs after cleavage of the precursor, right? The first answer it always occurs in the cytoplasm. Well, no, these, all this is happening in the nucleus. But, you know, beware the word always. In any question I give you, if it's always, it's not right. Because nothing is always in biology. Poly A is added at the five prime end. No. No, it's always added at the three prime end. The five prime end would be all the way to the left, so that's not happening. And it's specified by stretch of view. That's certainly true for RNA viruses, but not for DNA viruses. Splicing marks mRNAs for nuclear export. You cannot get out of the nucleus unless you're spliced. And that's because <clears throat> when, when an mRNA is spliced, a lot of proteins bind to it, as I showed you very briefly before. And those proteins, like SR, for example, and T-Rex1, <laughs> what a great name for a protein. <laughs> These are recognized by 
components of the nuclear export pathway. So there are a whole system of proteins in the nucleus that help move proteins out of the nucleus through the nuclear pore, which is shown there. And they recognize specifically the splicing related proteins. And so that's why a spliced message can get out. And the unspliced message doesn't have these proteins bound to them, so they won't get out. But there are some viral RNAs that have to get out unspliced. And for example, retroviral uh, RNA has to be unspliced because it's gonna be incorporated into the virus particle. Some of it is spliced for sure, but the spliced parts are not gonna go into virus particles. So how do you export unspliced mRNAs? So just to remind you, the cellular pre-mRNAs can be exported because the proteins bound in the splicing step are recognized by the export machinery. So here's a retroviral uh, RNA where you have uh, this, this part of the molecule here that would normally be spliced out has to be retained to put them into virus particles. Well, there is a sequence at the three prime end of the genome called CTE or constitutive transport element that binds the nuclear export machinery. And those two proteins, NFX and NXT, they are components of the export machinery and that gets the unspliced message out of the cell. So that doesn't exist in the cell, and that's why cell mRNAs need to be spliced in order to get out. So that's one example. Uh, there's another example for HIV, again, where <clears throat> unspliced mRNAs that are produced by transcription in the nucleus have to be exported to be put into virus particles. <clears throat> and that's done in the following way. There is a, an element at the three prime end called the REV responsive element, and it binds a protein that is recognized by the uh, export machinery, and that will get that full length unspliced mRNA out of the nucleus. REV is made from a spliced mRNA. So these mRNAs undergo a lot of splicing and export in order to make different proteins. But at some point, REV goes back in the nucleus, binds to that element, and now the whole mRNA can be exported and be packaged into virus particles. So. That's how viral mRNAs, and there are many other examples, can be exported uh, without being spliced. So just in summary, uh, splicing gives you value added. You can make, by alternative splicing, different mRNAs, different proteins, and that for a small genome, like SV40, make, you can make many, many more proteins than you would think from just having, say, two mRNAs. So different mRNAs, different proteins. You can also regulate gene expression at the level of splicing. So you don't have to just do it at initiation of transcription. You can regulate what splicing happens, what kinds of pattern happens by making proteins that bind uh, to the DNA during this process. Another kind of post-transcriptional modification of RNA, we mentioned this last time, is RNA editing. This is where the RNA is made and then there are enzymes in the cell that can edit it. So here, the example here is hepatitis delta virus, where uh, the, the virus is actually a negative stranded circular RNA molecule, uh, which encodes a single mRNA for what's called the small delta antigen. But there are enzymes in the cells called deaminases, which remove the amine groups from the base, so it will change an A to an I, uh, and that that changes the codon from a stop codon into a tryptophan, and now you can make a larger protein. So an example of how non-templated editing can give you more coding capacity. And finally, there are lots of other uh, RNAs in the cell that don't code for proteins. And for years, we ignored these. We didn't know what they meant. And now it's just amazing what they can do. These are called non-coding RNAs. So you know, there are tRNAs in the cell, and you know there are ribosomal RNAs as well. But there are a lot of RNAs that are classified in different ways and have a lot of different functions. And these are not only in cells, but in viruses. So we have microRNAs, as you can see there. These are short RNAs that have regulatory functions, they can regulate gene expression. We have long non-coding RNAs and we have circular uh, RNAs. And so this is the microRNA pathway where we have some mRNA made by Paul II in the nucleus here. And then it's, in certain cases, it's processed by enzymes to give these shorter uh, microRNAs. Uh, 
which are double-stranded, they're exported, and they associate with a processing complex to eventually make them single-stranded. And these would be complementary to some mRNA. So for example, they could bind uh, an mRNA, and together with a host of cell proteins, uh, they can inhibit its translation or they can cause degradation of the mRNA. So these are regulatory uh, mRNAs, microRNAs, and you can imagine that they could regulate viral genomes, they could also be made by viruses to antagonize host cell defenses. Hepatitis C in particular requires one of these microRNAs for replication. Hepatitis C virus is a Flavy virus with a positive strand RNA genome, has a highly structured five and three prime end, as you can see. And at the five prime end, this one stem loop structure right at the five prime end, base pairs with two copies of a microRNA called MIR122, MIR122, microRNA, that's what MIR stands for. This is a liver-specific microRNA. It's not found in any other cell type in our body. It regulates cholesterol metabolism, and it is absolutely needed for virus, hepatitis C virus reproduction. Without those microRNAs, the virus will not reproduce. So you could introduce those into other cell types, those microRNAs, they will allow the virus to reproduce. And actually an antiviral has been developed which binds to that microRNA and prevents uh, hepatitis C virus replication. So very cool stuff. The circular RNAs are, are very strange. They're produced by backslide splicing. So here we have a pre-mRNA uh, with some uh, exons and introns. And instead of splicing from the five to the three prime end, it can happen in a reverse sense to give you circular uh, RNAs of different sizes with different combinations of the, of the uh, introns and exons that are found here. Some cells have thousands and thousands of copies of these microRNAs. They seem to be elevated in some cancers as well. And we're just beginning to figure out what they do, but they seem to be sponges. So they, here's a circular RNA that is, to which is attached microRNAs, maybe for storage. These are particular microRNAs, the little red lines. They're complementary to the circular RNA and they're just hanging there until they're used. And uh, there's also circular RNAs that can be storage depots for RNA binding proteins as well. So these are pretty interesting and um, functionally remains to be seen what they do. And the last thing I wanna tell you about is a relatively recent discovery, which is how methylation of, of, ad, of adenine, adenosine nucleotides regulates function. So here's an adenosine, of course, the ribose and the base, that's the adenine base up there. And that can be methylated. That nitrogen can be methylated, as you can see here. That's N6 methylation because that's the six nitrogen uh, in the base. And the methyl can be added or removed and it will have different functions. And we have very creative words for describing this. We have writers that put the methyl group there. We have readers that see if the methyl group is present and have some response. And then we have erasers, which can remove the methyl group. So, you know, scientists can be creative sometimes. Readers, writers, and erasers. Anyway, for um, th these have a function. And on the right uh, is shown uh, a function of this methyl. So the, in the replication of hepatitis uh, C virus, uh, the, the MR, one of the mRNAs uh, can be methylated. And if you deplete the enzymes that put on the methyl, you, en you will enhance the reproduction. So the cell is attempting to repress viral reproduction by methylating the RNA. That's, that's a typical effect of that. Uh, and if uh, you take that away, you can enhance uh, assembly of the virus. All right, so we've talked about viruses today with DNA genomes and the key point, right, is that transcription will only happen on fully double-stranded DNA to get you mRNAs that you need for reproduction. Next time, we're going to talk about um, how those DNAs replicate in cells.